This is the second lecture for lesson two. Now that you understand a bit about why spatial stuff is special, what the first law of geography is, and how spatial autocorrelation works, I have a little bit about spatial thinking, I want you to understand a little bit more about the ground rules that establish what's possible when it comes to spatial relationships, because how these different things act in space is pretty important. We need something called spatial topology, the set of relationships that spatial features can have with one another in order to understand what's possible when two things come together or two or more things come together in space. And this sounds a little very jargony and complicated and theoretical, but hang in there with me for a second. And as I'm doing these examples, I'm going to try to ground them in how people relate to one another in space to try to give you a, a better grasp on the concepts. So there are seven major spatial relationships that I want to cover here. And I'm going to do four in this one and three in the next slide. This sh slide shows the first four that I want to cover. So they have the equals principle. That's where you have entity A is the same as entity B. And in a relationship, it could be like when you first met your spouse and you felt like you were one thing, right? You were something amazing together. You could have A touching B. That could be the touching relationship. Our first kiss might be very gentle, no tongue. You can have overlapping relationships. So that's where A and B have multiple points in common. And that could mean that, like, you know, during your honeymoon, you do something. And that something might lead you to the contains relationship, where A contains B. So for nine months, the baby might be inside and way quieter. And then you have relationships like disjoint. That's where A shares nothing with B. So it could be that after that happens, um, you're kind of sick of each other and you watch TV from opposite sides of the room, right? You're not, you're not sharing anything at that point. It's kind of a bummer. You could also have, if you're a dog owner, uh, a covering B, or vice versa. So the dog sleeps on top of you, creating a huge amount of heat and being really annoying all night. That's a covered relationship. And then you can have things with paths, too. So you might have uh, the crosses relationship, and that's where A and B have at least one point in common. And so although, although we both know how to find our way home from the grocery store, the only routing point that my wife and I have in common is our driveway at the very end. Those are some of the basic relationships and you might be thinking, well, what happens if we ignore those? Well, consider stuff like MapQuest and Google Maps. Without spatial relationships and having some way of understanding them and codifying them, those things would never be able to do anything useful. Here's why. Consider having 500 road segments that encompass your neighborhood and the nearby region. Let's say you went out with the GPS and you uh, collected all that information. If those things, those little pieces of data don't understand how they relate to each other in terms of their connections, there's no way you can have a computer do routing, can it? Can you? So what if you have half of those roads as one-way streets, or some of them are divided highways, uh, some that only provide right turns instead of left turns onto the next road? You'd have to have all that logic built in there, all that topology in there, in order to do anything useful with that information. So these relationships are actually really important. Another really important thing that's fundamental to geography is the concept of scale. And there are two major key concepts, concepts of scale that I want you to understand for this class. One is the concept of scale that probably popped into your mind immediately that uh, you're just thinking of right off the top of your head, and that's map scale. That's the ratio of the distance on the map to the real distance on the Earth. So that could be one inch on the map equals a thousand miles uh, in the actual planet, right? And we get into some problems here with language because Cartographers, geographers talk about large scale and small scale in a way that probably differs than, than how you might refer to it yourself. You might think of large scale meaning a continent or a country and small scale meaning a little town. That's how most people kind of refer to it in uh, normal terms. But in fact, large scale would be something like 1 to 1,000, where the fraction itself is bigger than small scale, which would be 1 to 10 million. And a 1 to 1,000 map would be something like a neighborhood, so zoomed way in on the Earth, right? And a small scale map would be 1 to 10 million zoomed way out. It might be a whole continent, like showing South America, for example. That's one kind of scale. The other kind of scale is the scale of analysis. The specific geographic context used to understand a problem is what I'm talking about here. So that could be that you're looking at an analytical problem at the neighborhood, the county, the state, the country, the continental level, the planetary level, right? If you're looking at stuff in space in general, space outside space. So the scale of analysis really has more to do with what you need to know in order to understand a problem than it does with anything to do with the map scale itself. You could have lots of different map scales used to explore a problem that impacts 
the scale of analysis at a state or a country, right? So those are the two major kinds of scale I want you to understand. And finally, we need to talk about time. So spatial relationships, spatial autocorrelation, spatial thinking, scale, all that stuff is really important, but you wouldn't really have any of that stuff without time. Almost everything in geography involves a dynamic process of one type or another. There's something happening over space during time. It's not just one snapshot. And maps often make it pretty hard to see time as an explicit factor because they tend to be snapshots of time, unless they're an animated map or something like that that's designed explicitly to show time, which is pretty uncommon. Let's look at an example here. This is an air photo collage uh, showing Salzburg. This is using Bing Maps. And uh, Salzburg is a, 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 one of the most beautiful cities on Earth, and Austria, of course. And you might be able to see it right away, but let's zoom in. If you look at the middle of this map, you'll see a place where two images are slammed next to each other. Um, they're from two different sources. They're actually from two different times as well. Uh, the stuff on the west side is of a lower resolution and taken at a different time than the stuff on the east side, which is of a higher resolution. So if you look in the corner of any web browser, uh, when you look at a web map, you'll see, usually in the lower right corner in this case, uh, you'll see some copyright information there that gives you a hint about where the imagery is coming from and what times those images were taken. Notice that nothing very specific here is shown, but we do know that the west side of the image is taken from 2012 from one sensor, and the east side of the image is taken in 2013 from another sensor. It could be that the stuff in the west side was taken in the springtime, 2012, and the stuff in the east side was taken in the fall of 2013, meaning that there's quite a bit of time between those two images. And certainly in a place like Salzburg, you could have all kinds of things change in the landscape, right? You could have new buildings, new roads, uh, old stuff could go away, you could have new bus stops crop up, all kinds of things like that. So time's a very, very important factor in geography. Every map you see includes data that usually comes from a, a wide variety of times, depending on the type of data that you're showing. So this is an important factor. It doesn't mean that you can't use this stuff, but it's definitely something to consider. And something I need to consider is that this lecture is also out of time. So... Time for me to wrap up.